Hey guys, Toby Mathis here with Infinity Investing. Today we're gonna to talk about the greatest investment strategy of all time. I'm gonna use my buddy Warren Buffett as the example. And we're gonna get into the weeds a little bit, so I apologize, but it's really important that you understand his journey so you understand why he's considered one of the greatest investors of all time. Number one, Warren Buffett is the grandfather of something called value investing. And value investing is kind of like this. Let's say that you were going to invest in jelly beans and there was a whole bunch of jars out there and they're called publicly traded companies. And you could see by looking inside the jar and counting how many jelly beans are in there. So if I know that a jelly bean is worth a dollar and there's a hundred jelly beans in a jar, then I could say that that company is worth a hundred dollars, right? You're looking at it saying all things being equal, that's worth a hundred bucks because there's a hundred jelly beans. What if that jar had a thousand jelly beans in it and you could buy it for a hundred dollars? That would mean it's an undervalued company. That's an undervalued jar because people don't realize that there's a thousand jelly beans in there. And that's what a value investor is doing is they're trying to figure out what the actual value of what is inside the jar is. And that's where Buffett was, again, absolutely fantastic. He would look for these companies. He would value their real estate. He would value their leaseholds to see whether the leases are worth more, if they're really long-term leases. He would figure out the depreciation schedules. He'd go out and say, not only was a building depreciated over time, and depreciation means you're taking a deduction so that that value of that building, that basis, I mean, the basis is here, but the, but the actual book value is, is getting driven down. Uh, it's kind of like writing off a car. You write off the car, it doesn't really have any book value but it still has a value to third parties. But you'd have to go in and figure out what is inside that jar and how much is it worth. And when you start dealing with companies with billions of dollars of assets, it's a lot of work, but it's exceptionally rewarding when you find companies that are undervalued. So that's kind of the starting point, is figuring out that there's companies out there that have assets that are considerably more valuable than what the market is telling you. And then there's the market value, we call it Mr. Market. You, know, you go in there and say, what is the market? What is the value of the company? Whatever the market is telling us. There's enterprise value, there's all these different techniques. But in a nutshell, what you're trying to determine is, is the share price representative of the actual value of that company? If I was looking at real estate, I might say, here's a piece of real estate and if I value it like my realtor might, which they use comps, and they look around the town and they say, hey, other, other properties are selling for this, you might get one value. But if you value it as an investor might value, which is called cap rate, where you're getting a income stream, you might value the income stream even higher or lower. So depending on how you value that, it's so like, let's say that I have a building in San Francisco, where the comps are really high, like you have to pay up the nose to get properties, but an investor looks at it and says, I'm not really making much money on my money because the, it's so expensive to buy a piece of property by the time I get all my rents in and all my expenses and operations and all that, I'm really making one or 2% on my money, I'm not really interested. In some case, it's negative. So there's different ways to value things. What we focus on is more on the side of the investor. I'm not interested in a company that's going to just grow in value over time, I am looking at compounders. And I believe that's the greatest strategy. Like if you wanna get into where Buffett really makes his money, it's in compounding. And I'll explain it like this. Had Buffett passed away when he was in his 50s, he would have been considered a fairly normal investor. But the longer he lives, the more compounding his baseline grows. In other words, when you look at compound interest, the chart grows exponentially. It doesn't grow geometrically where it's just a static line. Your house, when you invest in it, chances are it's just going to grow on a static line. When we look at 50-year histories of property, they grow pretty consistently on a line. Gold grows pretty consistently on a line. Stocks that are just growth stocks, in other words, they're not paying anything out. They're just holding on. They grow pretty much on a straight line. When you want to see exponential growth, 
in any of those assets, you need to have compounders. And compounders is when you are making money on your money. In other words, I'm not dependent on buying a stock at $10 and hoping that it goes to 20. If it does that, I would have to sell it at 20 to make any money. I pay tax on that $10 that I made as well, and it's a one-time deal. So one of, one of uh, I would call them Buffett's acolytes, was talking about this, saying we were constantly going out trying to look for deals, and then when you made money on one, the next thing you had to do is go out and find another deal that you could make money on. And it was very exhausting and very hard and a little bit risky as opposed to just finding one good deal that then rewards you for a per perpetual period of time. And that's what we focus on at Infinity Investing. We start focusing in on finding one good deal and then it pays you forever. You don't sell it. Our whole idea is that our holding period is forever. And that's actually a great quote from Buffett because when they asked him what was your holding period on these companies that he was acquiring, he'd say forever. My intent is to hold them forever. Like there's a benefit to holding these types of companies. They're constantly paying the shareholders. For example, he bought Coca-Cola in, in the 80s. Coca-Cola has been increasing the payout to its shareholders every year for over 56 years. Every year, whether because you know, it makes money every year and it doesn't hoard the cash. It doesn't just sit there on the cash. It pays out a big chunk of it to its shareholders. And every year, it pays the shareholders more. You do that for 50 years, the amount that you're receiving at the end of 50 years is more than you even paid for the company. In most, most cases, you start realizing that not only does the company grow, but the dividend grows. And the dividend growth could be 10, 15% a year. Now we're starting to look at something very differently. We're starting to look at companies going, oh, what are the most healthy companies that are nicely profitable and are gonna be around in 100 years? That changes our dynamic completely from what's the next, you know, hey, what's the next Amazon? I want to see if it goes up really fast, where they don't pay anything out to their shareholders. You're basically giving an Amazon an interest-free loan, and they hoard that cash. They move it into other countries. And yes, they're dominating an industry, but you're not getting a benefit out of that. The only way you'd get a benefit is if you sold your position. So it's a little bit frustrating. As an investor, you want to be able to live off of your investments without selling them which means we're only interested in investments that actually reward us and pay out that dividend. And when you look at the success of companies over time that have you know, historically given out increasing dividends for 10, 25, 50 years, it significantly outperforms the rest of the market. And if all you're doing is saying, I want good companies that are profitable, that are paying out, we start, we start focusing on that, has lots of value, it's, it's a great deal, but instead of hoarding the cash and trying to, to jack up their balance sheets that way, they're paying out to the shareholders. That keeps that share price, by the way, more moderate. It's not, it doesn't have all that cash jacking it up. So think of it like this. We'll go back to our jelly beans. We're going in and we're finding a company that it, we're, we're looking at the jar and we're buying, a, let's say there's 100 j jelly beans in there. We're saying, hey, we could, we could pay 90 dollars for that hundred jelly beans, right? And you were, hey, that's a really good deal. But what if every year they paid you 10 jelly beans and every year they increased the number of jelly beans. So in year one, it was 10, year two, it was 11, year three, it was 12, year four, it was 13. Like every year they increased out that payment. That's what we're looking for. We don't just want to buy the jelly beans. We want to buy the production. We want to buy the machine that's going to continue to pay us. So when you look at Buffett and you look at his net worth, it goes like this because he's very interested in compounders. He's very good at picking companies that are historically very great. And you want to know the punchline is his investment, his investment company, Berkshire Hathaway, they don't pay dividends. So he literally says, this is what we're focusing on. This is where we make a ton of money. And then his own, the company that he has all the investors in doesn't even pay out the dividends. Of course, they're going to grow in value like crazy. The guy's crazy like a fox. He's super smart. And he's like, he and Charlie Munger, they have some great quotes. But one of the things they really looked at is this long-term investing approach. And we say infinity investing, you can't get longer than infinity. So we're buying things that's an income stream for two, 300 years, 
That's what we're really looking at. If you want to benefit your kids, 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 and your kids, 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 then you want to have something that nobody has to mess with. You buy it once and you let it reward you for hundreds of years and it works great. It's a different way of looking at things and it's identifying compounders. The income on the income. If all you paid like on a credit card was straight interest, hey, I paid 7% a year and this is what it looked like, the credit card companies wouldn't be making much money. If you pay 7% uh, interest on top of the 7% interest, like you're paying interest on the interest you are accruing, now it's growing much, much quicker because it's not just simple. Now it's compounding interest. And the rule 72 is the easiest way to look at this. Whatever your interest rate, divide 72 by that number, and that's how many years it takes it to double. So if I have interest rate of 10% and, I'm con and I have compound interest, fantastic. I will, I will double my money every 7.2 years. And that's not a bad return and you're doing just great. So you got to identify those compounders and you'll do great. That's the greatest and best investment strategy of all time. Hands down, period, is getting rid of the noise and zeroing in on compounders like a laser beam. If you like this type of information, please like and subscribe. If you believe that there's somebody else that could really use this information, please share it. And if you want us to hit on a different topic, please leave us a comment and we'll read over it. And if you have any ideas out there that you want us to cover, that's where we get them from you guys.